we are live now so a very good evening everyone this is dr asnath reporting from pulse pharma so i welcome you all to this very exciting evening with uh, our uh, delegate speakers so before going ahead uh, i would just like to do some formal introduction of my organization so for that i would request the video please mm -hmm. reflection of the heart and its functioning a heart that is compassionate about others and passionate about its work a heart that is dynamic yet consistent a heart that is predictable and reliable a heart that goes the extra mile to deliver what is expected our business philosophy encompasses these very principles at pulse pharma we feel patients problems think innovate and do everything that it takes to deliver cost effective solutions we have a well aligned leadership team and a highly motivated functional team to carry out our mission we innovate and develop products with unique functional characteristics that help us serve our customers needs better we develop innovative business processes that help us improve our efficiency and customer experience we have world class infrastructure that includes an integrated r&d center and three manufacturing facilities that help us develop and manufacture high quality differentiated products our research efforts are focused on developing nanotherapeutics nutri therapeutics and cell therapeutics Our operational presence is spread across India and 40 countries worldwide. We reach out to nearly 250,000 healthcare professionals in various specialties through our sales team of over a thousand people and our partner sales force in various countries. At Pulse, we work with a real spirit of Pulse to bring about a positive difference in millions of lives because we are compassionate about people. and passionate about our work uh, so thank you for the video now i will just run a few slides about the company so just keep it on is my slide visible yeah yes yeah so the second yeah so we are a patient centric innovation driven integrated pharmaceutical company with inclusive growth model and uh, we are a 26 years yeah uh, uh, young company of and we are having active presence across india and emerging markets we have a world class r&d and manufacturing infrastructure and along with strong leadership and operational teams across all business function we are leading the space in nano pharmaceuticals and drug delivery research with our very own patented technology one of our product is dexel uh, nano that is uh, with the made with uh, that is made with the equel nano technology our patented technology we are having strong presence in medical nutrition through pulse nutri science and we are also pouring into immuno cell therapeutics by developing novel cart t cell therapeutics our business philosophy includes create customer value through high quality differentiated products and services by using advanced and patented technologies with this i would like to now introduce our operator for today that is dr raju ishwaran so uh, a small gist of dr raju ishwaran who is already a very well known figure among the orthopedics so for that uh, just a second So, Dr. Raju Ishwaran, he he did his MBBS from Maulana Azad M Medical College, uh, in Delhi, in 1998. He followed up doing MS Orthopedics again from University of Delhi in 2003. Now, currently, he is attached to uh, Shri Minakshi Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Clinic as a director and as a principal consultant in Max Super Specialty Hospital, Shalimar Park, both in Delhi. His core skills include arthroscopy of the knee, shoulder, and hip. with soft to reconstruction and he's very well uh, known figure in orthopedic sports injuries 
uh, talking about his uh, achievements. So he's a treasurer of Society of Knee Surgeons of India. Uh, he was he was a past member of I ISAKOS, use that editorial board, and he's also a Rotary member of the Lights. And also a past executive committee member of Indian Arthroscopy Society. With this, I would like to welcome Dr. Raju Ishwaran on stage and take us ahead. Over to you, Dr. Raju. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hasnath. If you can stop sharing, I'll start. I'll just yeah, share. Just a second, sir. Just a second, sir. Yeah. Over to you, sir. Yeah. So I'd like to uh, begin with a note of gratitude for letting me moderate such an intellectually heavy panel. Uh, all the panel members are well known. Uh, we start with Dr. Parag Sancheti, a uh, very prominent uh, joint replacement and sports medicine surgeon based out of uh, Pune, uh, the past secretary of the Indian Arthroscopy Society and very active and dynamic in uh, most conferences that you see organized in our country and abroad. It's a great pleasure to be able to moderate uh, Dr. Bharat Modi. Uh, Dr. Bharat Modi is a man of multiple talents, one of which is joint replacement surgery of both the knee and the hip. He has uh, immense managerial skills and he's uh, very well known in the orthopedic community, both for his academic and for, for his intellectual insights. Uh, Dr. Ronan Roy from uh, Kolkata is a knee replacement uh, surgeon. Uh, he is the former president of the Indian Arthroplasty Association and a former legal chair of Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons. Uh, he uh, is renowned uh, with the, the Inspiring Orthopedician of India Award, the Economic Times in 2022, a well-awarded person. And he was just sharing with me of the various uh, unique meetings that he organizes as the pre former president of the West Bengal Arthroplasty Society. We are also joined by Dr. Vidyanand Raut from Mumbai. He's practicing at various hospitals across Mumbai as a consultant joint replacement surgeon. Like our other panelists, heavily awarded, widely published, and we look forward to his comments and insights as the course goes on. Dr. Ashok Shyam is a person who needs no introduction. He is, uh, I call him the goddess Kali of orthopedics with multiple hands and a finger in almost every subspeciality of orthopedics. I sometimes envy how he manages to do so much in the 24 hours that are given to all of us. Uh, very well known through Ortho TV that has uh, really brought orthopedic knowledge right to the fingertips of every uh, practicing orthopedic surgeon. So with this, I uh, would like to start a panel discussion in which we'd like to explore the role of anticoagulants yes. as they stand in our practice. Uh, Dr. Hasnath, do I go forward or uh, is there anything else that we would like to do in between? No, sir. No, sir. Uh, you'll take the stage ahead now. Wonderful. So I'll just project uh, my presentation. It's just it's going to be a very interactive uh, presentation. This is not didactic. And uh, the purpose is to ask simple, practical questions which uh, we face in our everyday practice, both as arthroscopy surgeons and as joint replacement surgeons. So I would first like to start with Dr. Bharat Modi. Uh, we all are very afraid of DVT and the primary reason why we are afraid of DVT is because of the dreaded complication of pulmonary embolism. Uh, as practicing orthopedic surgeons, we may not clearly appreciate the fine line, dividing line between DVT and pulmonary embolism. In your practice, sir, uh, what is the percentage of DVT that you see which actually progresses onto pulmonary embolism and when should the orthopedic surgeon be worried and really worried? Right. So it's a very uh, pertinent question, Raju. Uh, most of us in India, at least about going back 10 years, uh, we seem to be in the impression that Asians or specifically Indians were almost uh, invulnerable to this problem of DVT. I don't think uh, today you would find as, as widespread a belief on this fallacious point as it, it was in our younger days, which was about 10 or 15 years back. Because now there's adequate evidence to show that DVT is a very, very definitive occurrence in our subset of patients of the, uh, of the Indian population, specifically relevant to major orthopedic surgery, whether it be joint replacement or uh, a major fracture uh, trauma. And I'll give you my personal uh, insight into how I have understood this to be a real problem. One was 
when i participated in the global clinical trials on on the molecule rivaroxaban and then apixaban and as part of this global trial it was mandatory to subject all the patients which were included in the trial for ascending venography which is the gold standard to establish dvd right yeah i was surprised at the end of the entire trial to see the rate at which as a dvt was detected in my group of uh, patients who underwent total knee replacement surgery uh, my memory might not serve me very accurately but it was certainly in the figures of the high 30s uh, in my subset and uh, this uh, you know really woke me up as to the the fact that dvt is a very very definitive problem in our population besides this i have also learned the hard way which i have got forbid none of us should learn the hard hard way but i have learned it the hard way when over my 30 years of career i have now realized that i have ended up losing patients to pulmonary embolism which leads me to answer your question as to the difference between dvt and pe so dvt is when a clot forms in the limb uh, lower limbs after a major surgical act uh, uh, or it could happen even without it but for the purpose of this audience i would say after a major orthopedic surgical act dvt is something that is uh, triggered off uh, due to the fuckaus triad and if it is in the calf veins it is still not a risk but as soon as it starts going into the levels uh, upper levels then popliteal and onwards it becomes a loaded double barrel shotgun which can be triggered into a deadly shot uh, the moment that clot dislodges and heads towards the right side of the heart the the death is literally instantaneous and in those few cases which i will forever remember in my career i have seen a patient of not oh i in fact i have seen, seen three patients of mine who on the day of discharge the family had come to collect them they went to the loo came back complained of sudden gabrahman as it is called in our language and just collapsed and these were the classic pulmonary embolism fatalities so to answer your question dvt is definitely a problem in our cases pulmonary embolism is when a dvt turns into its deadly form in which the clot uh, migrates from the lower limbs uh, up into the heart and i would suggest that each one of this audience starts paying very good attention to the subsequent discussions because it will help you prevent what i have already seen in my career thanks sir like there's two things if i may raju i mean uh, i tend to agree with what bharat has been saying so far in that uh, in the past i think uh, we've really been like ostriches keeping our heads in the sand and uh, one of the reasons i think is that because orthopedic patients are in especially in our country lost to follow up and if they come with a breathing problem or a, a <clears throat> other issues they normally end up either in the cardiology team or in the medicine department but anywhere but orthopedics so when the problem arises i think the orthopedic surgeon is blissfully unaware that a major event has occurred that's the first thing the other thing that is actually uh, made me wake up is that uh, over the last 4 5 years especially in our hospital any patient who has a drop in uh, oxygen saturations in the first 3 uh, or 4 days after surgery usually has a ctpa that's a ct of the pulmonary arteries and it's surprising how many small emboli are actually picked up so uh, that itself it should goes to show that uh, dvt and even pulmonary embolism is possibly not as uh, low as we believed in the past and i think uh, 30 35% uh, is probably an underestimate and um, definitely just the tip of the iceberg as far as the problem is concerned so uh, i think south we've got south asian data very hard uh, indian data i think apart from dr sanjay agarwal's paper there really hasn't been that much of a large large study but i think that uh, we, if we did a large study uh with ascending venograms as uh, bharat suggested then we would probably find pretty large numbers 
and this is in sync with what is published and uh, as dr bharat mentioned and as you reiterated that calf dvt is something which is uh, still a less threatening form of dvt but then the large vein dvt central vein dvts that can progress onto pulmonary embolism very quick two images to review the venous anatomy of the lower limb uh, so it's the dvt basically in the popliteal vein or in the femoral vein rather than in the small saphenous vein which is of greater concern because as you can see it can directly drain to the external iliac and the common iliac thereafter now i'd like to ask uh, dr parag what is the incidence of dvt in your joint replacement practice and do you notice a difference in incidence in terms of knee replacement and hip replacement i think parag has left i saw oh i see uh, he had some connectivity issues maybe then i'll pose this question to dr vidyanand raut uh, dr raut if you can please kindly answer this question yeah so i would say the literature suggests that dvt is more common in the knee patients uh, those who undergo total knee replacement but somehow clinically i have found that it, there is a equal preponderance between the hip and the knee cases and it's more in related to a lower limb surgery and the post op immobilization also it's uh, related to the duration of the surgery i think that is a point that we are going to discuss right so if you if i were to ask you to put a percentage a number to it a rough number to it in your joint replacement practice what is the number that you think uh, in your practice uh, the incidence ranges at well i mean i would give thromboprophylaxis I mean to all patients so but if there were no prophylaxis i would reckon that the incidence would be in the 40 or 50% subclinical dvt but yes dvt in right. both hips and knees I just like to add to what Vidyanand has just said that uh, basically I think that what he says is right that the number of distal DVTs is definitely probably going to be higher in uh, knee replacement patients, but the more dangerous proximal DVTs yeah. are probably more uh, prevalent in the hip replacement patients, and we also tend to be uh, less aggressive as far as mobilizing mobilizing the hip patients are concerned. I think. most of us wait for at least a day sometimes even two days before mobilization whereas now for most knee replacement surgeries we tend to mobilize uh, well later the same evening or if you have an evening surgery early the next morning so you're mobilizing within 8 to 12 hours of the surgery whereas hips normally mobilize 24 sometimes 36 or even 48 hours later so i think it's a combination of this and the fact that we tend to put the hip into all sorts of contorted positions whether you're you get an anterior anterior lateral exposure or a posterior exposure you do tend to uh, contort the hip during your surgery so i think these are all factors that probably predispose to uh, more proximal dvts in hip rather than in knee quite well taken so these are published facts and figures based on various series of papers and as you can see total hip and total knee arthroplasty are the clear leaders when it comes to all kinds of surgeries and uh, this is again uh, dr bharat answered it partially dr anand i would love your views to on this subject are indian patients less prone for dvt short and simple answer no dr vidyanand what is your take on this i would absolutely agree with that point i mean we are no different than the west because i remember as a resident we were taught by our seniors that uh, dvt is practically not seen by any of the orthopedic professors who had uh, mentored us and uh, i remember as that, a resident that was the age old thinking that indians or asians are come with uh, some sort of vardan that we uh, we don't get this problem but that's not the case true and i think published literature agrees with you we we have indian studies as dr anand said dr sanjay agarwala study uh, but then uh, this study published in the journal of thrombosis uh, says that in asian patients uh, the rate is no different and our own dr sanjay agarwala published very high numbers of uh, dvt in his series of patients this was i think published in the journal of surgery you know raju we Sir. refer to sanjay's paper but uh, i would invite each one of you to visit that paper Uh, first of all it was not a ascending venography established thing uh, it was a doppler study and in incidentally in his papers and to, to be honest it was a remarkable uh, uh, you know act in those days because it was a, a very well controlled uh, study but not for arthroplasty for hip fracture surgery and almost all his patients demonstrated 
lower in the sense calf level uh, devotees rather than proximal devotees okay. so while sanjay did point out the existence of devotee in our indian population his paper doesn't corroborate with the uh, proximal devotee but subsequently there have been certain pep studies and other international multi you know multi centric trials and the audience should not be in any uh, sort of doubt that dangerous proximal dvt is a very established phenomenon in our group of patients irrespective of what irrespective of whether you analyze sanjay's paper in detail or not so and uh, sir i would request you to continue what is your at risk population in which group of people you are the most worried about for dvt so typically you know i think uh, this applies uh, to uh, uh, across the global population but smokers diabetics obese patient uh, patients with uh, high uh, lipid profiles and especially anyone who has had previous history of uh, any form of dvt are extremely high risk cases in my particular opinion uh, i have no reason to state whether a male or a female will be at higher risk uh, because it would just be a impression rather than any real uh, uh, you know observation based on data collection or scientific uh, erudition uh, but in my part, uh, own uh, uh, we, we we now cover everyone with uh, dvt uh, type uh, dvt profile axis but if i had to be paranoid i would be paranoid about these cases which i have just told you obese uh, high bmi anyone with a bmi approaching 35 and above smoker diabetic uh uh you know uh, high lipid uh, pro profile and previous history thanks so what about age oh. if so i can ask doctor increasing age increasing you know, age. what is the cut off point uh, that you suggest in my opinion uh, every patient is at risk so even if they are above 60 uh, uh, or uh, you know less than 60 anyone who is undergoing the high risk category surgery which is a joint arthroplasty whether hip or knee or hip fracture surgery they are at risk and they are to be covered with uh, in fact i have extended the cover to acl reconstructions as well that's very interesting we'll talk about it later yes uh, dr nithyan you wanted to dr nithyan sir you wanted to put in a word no no i i just wanted to uh, ask dr modi if age has something to do with it he said about gender answer that uh, dr ronan i would value your inputs uh, in this do you like to add to what has already been said So I think that uh, uh, basically Bharat has covered all the points. To be very honest, I mean uh, the risk factors that he's outlined: uh, your BMI, your age, smoking, previous history of DVT, uh, uh, poor lipid profile, diabetics. I mean these are all the usual factors. And if for any reason uh, the patient has been immobile. Uh, especially uh, prior to hip surgery or you know very uh, bad knee surgery where the patient has actually got reduced mobility even before the operation i think uh, they are particularly increased risk okay. female sex i mean i i i also agree that we're not really sure it, i mean in india i think it's probably just the same to be very honest so these uh, facts and figures seem to suggest that a prolonged operative time which might be the case for a revision arthroplasty compared to a primary arthroplasty puts the patient at a much much higher risk with an odds ratio nearly approaching uh, 30 uh, dr ashok sham i would like to value your inputs on uh, uh, arthroscopy so dr bharat modi mentioned that he uh, has started to give prophylaxis for acl reconstructions we did this paper together a couple of years ago in which we found some indications for arthroscopy what are your views on uh, both these uh, spheres as a minimally invasive surgery meritorious of receiving dvt prophylaxis i think again it's all based on the risk assessment like even in our paper we found that there are certain uh, groups of patient that are higher risk for developing this kind of yeah. uh, dvt as well as the complication issuing it so we have to grade the patient assess their susceptibility to this and based on that we can give dvt prophylaxis so it cannot be an overall coverage like we talk about tkr and tkrs but it has to be individualized 
And uh, this is something I would like to understand from each of our panel. How serious is post-discharge DVT? This is something unheard of in sports medicine practice, but in the joint replacement practice, how serious is it? Dr. Bharat Modi, let's start with you, sir. Oh, oh my God. In fact, the real uh, load of uh, uh, pulmonary embolism-related fatal outcomes or even uh, non-fatal but morbidity outcomes are usually in the post-discharge uh, phase of the patient's overall recovery. Because these days, knee replacements or even fracture surgeries, patients are uh, discharged by the fourth day itself. And uh, there are extremely well-established uh, epidemiological uh, studies which graphically show that the tendency to develop deep vein thrombosis is, is not triggered and finished in the first three days, but it actually continues to rise and it's highest at around the 10th day, you know. So uh, all of us should be very sensitized to the fact that if at all our patient is going to run into trouble, it will be after they are discharged rather than whilst they are in the hospital. Unfortunately, that is a fact. And therefore, quite a lot of patients probably end up going into, uh, as Ronan said earlier in the discussions, that they end up going to other specialty wards and we don't even come to know of them. People and even the family might say, think that it, it was a heart attack, Agaya. You know, uh, the, the, without realizing that it is not a heart attack, uh, it's a pulmonary embolism. And I, if I remember correctly, the exact term he used was ostriches with our heads buried in the sand. So, Dr. Ronan, what is your typical discharge uh, day after a knee replacement surgery? And uh, do you face this post-discharge problem quite frequently, DVT? Well, well normally uh, we tend to discharge the patient uh, 48 to 72 hours after surgery. Younger patients who are mobile and doing well go home on the second day. Uh, older patients on the third and very rarely on the fourth day. So we're really going for a quick discharge. And that's all the more reason why we keep them on uh, thromboprophile axis. The knees stay for at least a month uh, and the hips for a bit longer, usually one and a half to two months. So four to, four to five weeks for knees, about six to eight weeks for hips, depending on how mobile they are, uh, how obese they are, how many other comor comorbidities that they have. But the most important thing is that uh, because we are uh, usually put them on these uh, uh, either apixaban or uh, rivaroxaban, we have sensitized the physiotherapists to look after them to get back to us in case that there is a bleeding issue or a hematoma that's arising so that we can manage that. But apart from that, I, I think that we, we're happy with the way things are going. Uh, Dr. Rauf, your inputs on this, ha, ha, what is your typical practice in Mumbai? When do you discharge your joint replacement patients? Yeah. Typically, 48 hours after surgery. If it's a bilateral, then 72 hours generally. But uh, as uh, Dr. Ronan and Dr. Bharat Modi said, the real problem starts on the day on day 5 and it gradually increases up to day 10. So we cannot, I mean... Uh, relax once the patient is discharged. We have to be vigilant. We have to sensitize the physiotherapist and we have to educate the patients and the relatives to look out for the danger signs. I think our panel has given a resounding message that uh, it is post-discharge when uh, uh, things really can go bad. And uh, the next set of questions in the same order, Dr. Bharat, what are your preferred agents for prophylaxis? Patient is admitted today for a knee replacement. What will you give him and what will you give him after discharge? So my uh, typical uh, preferred agents are the NOAX, the newer or the novel oral uh, anticoagulation agents in the form of uh, factor 10A antagonists, uh, which is basically epixaban and rivaroxaban. And uh, uh, my one of these two, and uh, we use both actually at our uh, center. And each one of our patients Initially, there was a choice given to them mainly from a uh, from a financial aspect that if they cannot afford one of these agents, then they would be at least advised an aspirin. And we can talk about it later. Uh, but now that the price points of these uh, phenomenally useful uh, therapeutic uh, agents or prophylactic agents have come down dramatically, it would be, in my opinion, a mistake to go for aspirin, but we can expand upon that later if you wish to. I At, at present, our practice is to uh, start the anticoagulation uh, about 12 hours 
uh, although some might argue why 12 hours, but anyway, just from the point of a surgeon's paranoia about bleeding, we start 12 hours after the surgical action is performed. And uh, in knee replacement cases, it continues for two weeks and in hip replacement for four weeks. So it's a bit shorter than what Ronan uh, has adopted in his practice. But the two weeks and the four weeks come from the data that has been garnered from multi-centric uh, global trials like the record trials. And therefore, this is adequate. But if someone wants to continue for a bit longer, I don't see any reason why they should not. Yeah. Dr. Ashok Sham, your views on this uh, preferred agents for prophylaxis? So I never go for black and white. It is always individualized. So we look at the patient if there is a high risk of bleeding then aspirin. If not, then Novax, as Dr. Bharat said. So we look at the patient profile, take a decision based on that. Dr. Ronan, uh, do you do anything different? The patient uh, is mine is actually uh, uh, quite different from this. I, normally, while they're in patients, we keep them on enoxaparin. And uh, uh, usually, they are given calf pumps as well uh, while they're uh, lying in bed. And once they're discharged, uh, if they're uh, low in, uh, risk patients, then we keep them on aspirin. If they're on high risk, which most of them are, then we put them on uh, usually on epixaban. Right. So, so no, just a moment, Raju, Raju, Raju. Sir. I want to ask Ronan. Ronan, why why such a mix and match? If if you have uh, if you are going to depend upon the efficacy of the oral agents. Uh, from the second day or third day onwards, which, because that's what your no, but, protocol for discharge. Bharat, the thing is that the ones that are going home on aspirin are relatively small. Let me just uh, delineate for you. It's usually the patients who've had a unilateral knee, who are young, who are fit, and who are already mobile very well by 48 hours. I mean, they're moving around, going to the toilet, or sitting around, doing their own things. So that's probably about... 10-15% of my practice. But it's the remaining 80-85% who go on, on, on Epixaban. No, but why why enoxaparin and uh, why not uh, oral agents early on? So because we, uh, I find that uh, the chances of having uh, perioperative bleeds tends to, in my practice, I found, when I started using Noax, I found that the dressing used to get wetter much more frequently and I don't usually put a drain. So the, 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 the knees tend to puff up a bit. And uh, so after 48 hours, once the leg starts looking okay and they're on the way, way home, I tend to put them on, on the pixel pen. I think oh. Dr. Parag has probably joined and I would like to put this question to him. Dr. Parag, can you hear me? Are you, are you there with us? Yes, yes, I can hear you and I'm there. Wonderful. So uh, we have covered a few points. Uh, we, I, we realized we had a bad network, but we had covered a few points before uh, this particular yeah. question. We would like to know your preferred agents for prophylaxis for hip and knee replacement surgery. Okay. So, you know, I mainly do knee replacement. So uh, my preferred agents are, we use a low molecular weight heparin. We start typically about, uh, you know, 8 to 12 hours after the surgery. Pondoparex, we use the uh, 0.4 or 0.6 as a loading dose and then 0.4 for two to three days. After that, the patient goes on to uh, uh, aspirin 75 milligrams twice a day for about three to four weeks. So that's, that's the general uh, thing, but it again sometimes varies a bit depending on. That's interesting. So, uh, Dr. Vidyanan, uh, uh, is your uh, protocol roughly similar? I think Dr. Parag's network yeah, it's is... Roughly, a... It's roughly similar. I, I would give enoxaparin for the first two nights that the patient is admitted. And on the day on the patient is to be discharged, then he would be converted yeah. to either rivaroxaban or off late to apixaban. And that would continue for two weeks in cases of knees and five weeks for hips. So, Raju, just a moment. I wanted to understand from Parag. Parag, why Fanda Parino? Yeah, that's what we've been using, you know, this uh, for a long time. And what we've seen is that the bleeding is hardly there. You know, sometimes there have been incidences when we use some other agents where probably the bleeding was more and we had to take back the patients to OR. But with this now, we've been using it for a long time and it's, 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 uh, it's pretty much 
the practice what we have. But you know, I've been That's hearing true. on and off what you said about rivaroxaban and the oral agents, and you know, I'm I'm very interested to know more about it. But at the moment, we are not using it at least for the knees. Fine, Raju, uh, for the audience, so that they understand that one of the major into inverted commas, uh, the major advances in the anti-coagulation fight has been the advent of these NOACs, which are orally admi administered. Yeah. Unlike the previous ones where only vitamin K antagonist in the form of warfarin was the only oral uh, administered drug. So this changed the game in terms of the ability to give long-term cover after a patient is out of the hospital setting. Whereas low molecular weight heparin, heparin itself, and including agents like fundaparino and idraparino. Idraparino was withdrawn because of uh, hepatotoxic issues. But fundaparino is still available in the market and rightly so. But these are all injectable. So that's yeah. why they have to change yeah. They have to change it, you know, so, so that the audience gets a complete understanding of this uh, issue about anticoagulants. And then when NOAX came, which is basically epixaban, rivaroxaban, there are other a couple of others also called edoxaban, etc. But let's not confuse the audience with that. So when NOAX came, the advantage was that that along with Debigatran, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor, these were orally administered uh, drugs, you know, and that changed the ability of the uh, treating doctor to cover them longer whilst they were discharged early from the hospital. And uh, what Dr. Parag just said was that he uses that whilst, uh, like Dr. Ronan Roy, he, they use the injectables whilst they are the patients are still in the uh, the in the hospital, and then switch on to the oral. In Parag's uh, uh, case, the, he goes on to the aspirin part, and in Ronan's case, he goes on to the uh, NOAX, the factor 10 antagonist. Speaking of aspirin, I'd just like to make two points here, if I may, Raju. I mean, please, first please. and foremost, that uh, the other major advantage is that NOAX had over warfarin, which was the previous oral anticoagulant, was that it does not need uh, dosage monitoring. monitoring. Yeah. Because that's a that's a huge issue with warfarin, mm -hmm. and, uh, so the, that was one big step forward. And as far as epixaban is concerned, I uh, as Bharat mentioned earlier in passing, it's the change in the price point that has made it uh, more uh, what should I say uh, usable in a lot of our patients. That's probably uh, one of the reasons why we've gradually made a shift from uh, rivaroxaban to epixaban, and also. The other advantage that we found with epixaban is that there seems to be a number of papers, including, uh, I think, one that was published in the Lancet, where it showed that epixaban actually probably has a is equally efficacious, if not slightly more efficacious. And at yeah, the same time, the bleeding to, is lower. The bleeding is lower. But I would like your comments, uh, since Dr. Parag mentioned that he puts his patients on aspirin, and uh, you have authored, uh, co-authored this very nice uh, article that I found online. Uh, why not aspirin? What, what uh, disadvantages uh, do you foresee with the use of aspirin? Well, so, uh, aspirin basically, uh, I wouldn't say there are any disadvantages as such. Unfortunately, the level of evidence that is available is is uh, B to C. I mean, apart from the European uh, Society of Anesthetics, I think, most of the others have not really come up with very strong uh, uh, recommendations for aspirin. I mean, gradually, the AOS and the ACCP have sort of grudgingly uh, admitted that aspirin can be used. And I think that was based, uh, a result of the literally a battle that took place between the surgeons and the chest physicians in America at the turn of the millennium. So in the first decade of the millennium, the, I mean, it was... Uh, almost that the ACCP said that orthopedic surgeons would be uh, liable to be sued if they just stuck to aspirin. And uh, that's what started everything off. But thankfully, they're more aligned now. And now aspirin is equally uh, uh, acceptable. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, we await on large-scale data and stronger data to see whether aspirin is effective. Oh, Ronald. Ronan, may I yes. may I bring this into a bit more sharp focus? This issue about sure. aspirin, aspirin versus uh, NOAX, you know. So, uh, gentlemen, uh, there are very well established studies, extremely well -established, impeccable studies, which show that aspirin 
there is a relative risk reduction if you use aspirin vis-a-vis -a, -vis a placebo in terms of DVT reduction of DVT rates happening with aspirin up to a point of 40%. Okay. The relative risk reduction, the RRR, when you use NOAX, jumps up to, up to 60%. As far as DVT is concerned, please pay attention uh, here. The word is DVT. What was the controversy that was triggered off at the uh, when, when commercial launch of NOAX? Rivaroxaban was first of the block. That was followed by Epixaban uh, more than 10 years back now. What happened was that when the ACCP said that based on the better rate of re risk reduction offered by NOAX as compared to aspirin in their guidelines, the first set of guidelines that they issued, they said that from now on, NOAX should be the drug of choice because of the advantage of oral administration, no monitoring required, very less food, food interaction, very little drug-drug interaction, which were all the handicap of the coumadin, you know, as it was known as a brand, which are the, basically means warfarin, uh, vitamin K antagonist. So when this happened, the AAOS, which is an equally powerful body, they questioned, and now here is where the subtleties start coming in. They questioned the conclusion of ACCP guys that DVT on its own is of no risk. It's only when pulmonary embolism happens that the real risk starts, uh, you know, manifesting itself. And is there any statistically validated difference between a pulmonary embolism rate when aspirin is administered as against NOAC is administered, you know? And the reason for not having a statistically validated case series for that is that pulmonary embolism occurs in roughly 1 to 2% of those who suffer from DVT. So to reach statistical significance, the number of patients that would have to be recruited in a prospective randomized double blind blah 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 trial would be so humongous that it is impossible to generate that sort of a data. So now the ACCP said that man, if you cannot have a PE without a DVT, so if you use DVT as a surrogate marker for the possibility of a PE occurring, if you reduce the rate of DVT in a better way as with NOAC, as compared to aspirin, why not acknowledge that in theory PE will also come down? But this was not agreed upon and therefore this entire fight and it, the entire world got confused unless someone took special interest and went into the details of how these messages have come across. As a result of a lot of, basically, if I could use the word negotiations or back and forth uh, interactions, eventually, all the major bodies, the AAOS guidelines, the ACCP guidelines, the NICE guidelines, and the other few guidelines, the anesthesiology guidelines, etc. Now, most of them have a watered down version, whereas a compromise, they say that a physician is at liberty to use either aspirin or NOAC, depending upon his sense of judgment as to what he wants to use in a given patient. So this is what the entire synopsis of the aspirin uh, controversy is. But if you look at dry data, and if you are agreeing that without a mother, you cannot have a child, which means without DVT, you cannot have a PE, then there is no doubt that more than aspirin, NOACs are far more efficacious in reducing the rates of DVT as compared to uh, aspirin. You know, I think that's, so that's a, the long and short of it. message that you have uh, put across, uh, Dr. Bharat, and uh, it's, I think, uh, well taken. NOACs are more effective than aspirin in lowering the rates of DVT. I think we've already discussed this point. Uh, the unpleasantness of a parenteral administration is something which would at least prevent the post-discharge usage of uh, low molecular weight uh, heparins. But as uh, uh, Dr. Parag and Dr. Ronan pointed out, they feel that in their surgeries, the use of uh, low molecular weight heparin or uh, agents like Ponda Parinux reduces the rate of uh, immediate bleeding concerns or the uh, wet dressings, uh, as Dr. Ronan pointed out. Uh, sometimes as orthopedic so surgeons... one question, Raju. Uh, Raju, between, you know, let's say low molecular weight heparin uh, or like enoxaparin or Ponda Parinux, is there anything preferred or which would you say between the two? And as compared to, a, you know what we are discussing, the later oral agents. So is there any comparison between these three ducts, let's say low molecular weight heparin like enoxaparin, fondoparinex, and 
uh, oral tene inhibitor so if i may may i but in or raju yes. you you could please no, no, uh, not, but uh, you can please answer but to my recollection fonda parinux is a slightly more refined uh, molecule it's a bit more heparin like uh, molecule but dr bharat i value your inputs on this so the uh, global trials uh, for uh, uh, see enoxaparin or in other words low molecular weight heparin has been the gold standard and even the trials for epixaban and rivaroxaban have been in the form of their the, the the sponsors or the manufacturers had to prove that these two noacs were non inferior to uh, low molecular weight heparin to enoxaparin uh, yes enoxaparin so it's a low molecular weight heparin you know lmwh you know so lm uh, noacs have proven themselves the us fda would ask that you can launch a drug as an anticoagulant only if you can show that it is non inferior to uh, enoxaparin and its safety profile has to be acceptable both these noacs were able to match that in fact there is a claim that uh, uh, you know apixaban could be a uh, slightly better than even lmwh but it is so slight that it doesn't really matter the important thing to take home as a message is that the noacs are as efficacious as lmwh which is the data on record and the basis on which the us fda granted them commercial launch now the pro the point that to be taken home is that lmwh while is still the favorite of vast majority of physicians because of habit rather than data or science you cannot administer lmwh with ease once the patient goes out into the field you know in the home situation yeah. and that is where noac take over hands down they are winners as compared to lmwh so you 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 can say that while they are in the hospital i would like to prefer because as ronan said and as parak said that there is a small worry that noax can cause a vp looking wound fair enough i mean you can do so if you want to do so there's no, nothing to criticize that approach uh, but the overall logic is to be understood that they are equal they have been proven to be equal in their efficiency of preventing dvt they have a slightly different bleeding rates minor bleeding rate differences major bleeding rates are almost equal in all uh, in terms of their risk but the minor bleeding rates which means non fatal or there are there, there are strict definitions to what is called a major and what is called a minor bleeding but uh, let's not go into those details but the minor bleeding rate is the safety profile is slightly better with uh, enoxaparin followed by epixaban and then lastly rivaroxaban absolutely i can make one point yes dr raut yeah so uh, so we can uh, sort of think of um, thromboprophylaxis in two phases one the first phase is when the patient is admitted when we could argue a case for enoxaparin and yeah. then we can shift to phase 2 now the question is in phase 2 when the patient has gone home the the perennial debate is between aspirin and noax so the one point where aspirin sort of scores over noax is its less bleeding tendency apart from uh, being easily available and being very cheap but uh, as dr bharat said the efficacy of noax is clearly much more than aspirin especially the conversion of dvt to p that is where probably exactly. the noax yeah. goes over aspirin there, there, so, there's an important study so, actually in progress at the moment started in 2019 the pepper study i think it's been run by stanford university uh, and uh, hopefully the data should be published in the next couple of years which compares aspirin uh, rivaroxaban and i think enoxaparin so it's a head to head comparison in lower limb surgeries so 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 that uh, i think will answer a lot of questions and uh, give us an idea of where aspirin really stands and uh, so uh, i mean it it should hopefully make things clearer if you have this debate uh, three years hence true so and before we go to the uh, just, before we go to these just another yeah. yes. yes dr anand so yeah so just to sir, add on to this even the withdraw triad for anticoagulants or your antiplatelets the hypercoagulopathy that is something that i think should be addressed by the physicians as you all 
because that is what I think is covered by anticoagulants and not by antiplatelets. Because if you see the Wilshaw triad, which is responsible for thrombosis, is having three parts. Endothelial injury, hypercoagulopathy, and stasis. So that for hypercoagulopathy, I don't think antiplatelets is the right option there. So your views, sir. I yes, think what, uh, Dr. Bharat, yes, please. Would you like to respond to uh, what Dr. Hasnan just raised? Yeah, so I think what Hasnan is uh, trying to point out here is that Farkov's uh, triad uh, is uh, about hypercoagulable status that is triggered off after any surgical act or any injury for that matter, surgery being one form of injury. So, and hypercoagulation is about triggering of that complex cascade of different coagulation factors getting into action. Platelet, as we must all remind ourselves, is actually not part of that cascade. It is, platelet is actually the end result of once a fibrin clot forms, platelet, platelets get aggregated onto it and turn that into a regular clot as we understand it. Yeah. So what I think uh, Hasan is trying to point out is that whilst aspirin is without doubt not an anticoagulant in the sense that it is it doesn't work on any of those coagulate coagulation cascade factors. It is the it reason why I projected this slide. Yeah, just yeah. as a revision for practicing orthopedic surgeons on what the coagulation cascade actually is. We have obviously all learned it in our physiology as undergraduate students. But I just like to remember rather than the in intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway, the PTT and the PT pathway, which makes it easy for me to interpret any variations in the test results. And uh, molecules like apixaban and rivaroxaban are activated factor 10 inhibitors. And as Dr. Bharat mentioned, dabigatrin, uh, which I've not heard many people using, is a direct thrombin inhibitor. So as you can clearly see, aspirin or uh, the platelets don't actually feature in this particular scheme of things. Uh, they feature far later. Uh, uh, just I to would add like... on to this, yeah, yeah. just to add on to this 10 inhibitors, even your NOx has a specific role with respect to BMI. So what I have gone through many meta-analysis is that even the BMI plays a very important role while choosing any anticoagulants. Like your, uh, if I say about your low molecular weight heparins, the, if the BMI is more than 35, then there is a risk of thrombocytopenia. Okay. The risk increases of thrombocytopenia after 35 rather than below 35. So even after 35, if you are thinking of the patient, then NOx is your preferred choice rather than going with uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin as per the meta-analysis because it causes more of the thrombocytopenia event. Right. So point that is what I have got through meta-analysis. Yeah. So point well taken. And in any case, when you are looking at a prophylaxis from a discharge point of view, the low molecular weight heparins already take a backseat uh, when uh, much more convenient oral agents are available. Uh, now, coming to the last uh, two slides of today's discussion, uh, we have two oral agents available uh, with us. Uh, Dr. Ashok Shyam, I would like to know your views on Epixaban uh, versus Rivaroxaban. Uh, Dr. Ashok Shyam, are you logged in right now? Or maybe I'll just transfer this question to Dr. Vidyanand Rao. Dr. Rao, what is your practice? You would have surely started with Rivaroxaban. Have you shifted to Epixaban and if so, why? Yeah. So, for a long time, we have been using Rivaroxaban. And it was quite uh, convenient to use. Once a day dosage was uh, deemed to be convenient. But now with the availability of Apixaban, another factor which has come in is that the half-life is just 12 hours. Peak plasma concentration is achieved in 2 to 3 hours. So in case of a missed dose or if there is a repeat dose or anything, it's much more easy to uh, control the problem compared to Rivaroxaban. Moreover, Apixaban... Uh, if there is a bleeding, if you stop a Pixaban tablet, the uh, uh, control is much more faster. So, as I said, uh, oral uh, ideal anticoagul uh, ideal anticoagulant agent should be easily available, orally administrable, and should be cheap. So, a Pixaban is a clear winner here. Though I, I am I am sure that there would be studies which would be coming in which would compare them further. Dr. Ronan, your inputs on Epixaban versus Rivaroxaban, what do you use in your practice? Well, I've gradually shifted over to Epixaban, just like uh, Dr. Rao said. Uh, basically, I think that 
two of the reasons that I've done that. One is, uh, well, three reasons. One is uh, relative renal safety. Two is uh, there has been a number of papers who show that uh, the bleeding, small, minor bleeding uh, profile seems to be much lower with apixaban as compared to uh, rivaroxaban. And the third thing is the drop in price. I think all three of these have actually made it easier for us to use it in in most in the patients that we do use no X. Uh, Dr. Parag, uh, I know you use aspirin, but surely you are looking at the uh, direct molecules as well. What would be your line of thought? Uh, what would you prefer for your patients? So I think Dr. Parag is out of network. We can, uh, Dr. Bharat Modi, would you like to comment on Epixaban versus Rivaroxaban? Uh, what uh, are your preferences? I think Ronan and uh, Vijayanand have uh, aptly summed up the issue. I mean, now we are uh, actually, uh, you know, basically talking about very fine points between the two options that are available. But yes, if one wants to focus on very fine points, then uh, Epixaban certainly has the advantage of a, uh, of, of a drug which has a smaller life half-life. And therefore, in case you detect any uh, worrisome bleeding issues on, at the wound site, stopping Epixaban would reverse the process earlier uh, as compared to Rivaroxaban. And uh, uh, overall, the bleeding rates have been slightly lower in uh, Epixaban as compared to Rivaroxaban. I'm not too sure of the cost com competitiveness of the two drugs in on the market these days. But uh, given a choice, for me, to be honest, Epixaban and Rivaroxaban both do quite well for uh, me. Uh, but it's up to each individual to then look at these fine points and decide which one they would like to adopt. Uh, the good news is the good news is that these uh, dr drugs are now available at very, very price competitive points. And therefore, um, I would be very surprised why anyone would want to continue with aspirin in face of the uh, evidence that there already exists about a better efficacy of these two drugs. Not I have a question. Yes, Dr. Asma. Yeah. So, in case we do run into a problem like bleeding with either apixaban or rivaroxaban, and if mere stopping of the tablet does not revert the problem, revert the issue, there is still bleeding, uh, how good is the antidote that is available i don't know if it's widely available but and it's very costly it seems but how effective is it it's not available Andex. as far as i know in india so so index and as something per latest, yeah yeah so as per the latest uh, news and and alpha to be precise the antidote so astrazeneca will be launching it soon in india the price uh, the price i do but uh, it would be somewhere I am not very sure but uh, it will be on a higher side but uh, that is what my point comes up here okay. I have gone through many meta-analysis I think one of the meta-analysis that has been published in a reputed journal for TKR and THR comparing rivaroxaban and epixaban because there has been no direct trial comparing epixaban and rivaroxaban so for that meta-analysis what I have seen is that epixaban and rivaroxaban both have equal efficacy when it comes to prevention of DVT, but in terms of bleeding, Epixaban is far superior as to Rivaroxaban with a significant value of T. So, significant T value of less than 0 0.05 stands for Epixaban in terms of bleeding tendency. So, if that antidote, as rightly mentioned by Dr. Vidyanan, if the antidote is available or not available, or even if it is costly, then Epixaban is the choice there because of the bleeding issue. Correct. So I think we are now at uh, the end of our presentation. And uh, before I realized that I think a good one hour has been spent in such enriching discussions, I would just like to wrap it all up by requesting each of our panel members to give their uh, concluding remarks. We will start with you, Dr. Ronan Roy. What, what do you feel uh, are the key takeaways from this uh, session, this hour of brainstorming that we've done? Well, I think the first and foremost thing is that we have to believe that our patients are equally at risk of DVT and uh, PE as compared to the Western literature. And if we still believe that our patients are immune or less uh, liable to develop it, I think we're just fooling ourselves. I think that's point number one. Point number two is obviously we should try and 
uh, fast track our surgeries as much as possible and get the patients up and about as quickly as possible. And uh, thirdly, uh, you do need to use some form of uh, DVT prophylaxis. And uh, as you've heard, uh, the different experts have had different uh, regimes, but uh, by and large, we tend to cover them for anything from two weeks to six weeks uh, uh, postoperatively. And the biggest issue is that these patients are maximally at risk between day five and day 10 of the surgery, by which time they're well at home. So it's important that we give them some form of prophylaxis and protection, and obviously make the patients aware that in case there's any problems, they should contact the treating hospital straight away. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ronan. Dr. Vidyanand Rao, I would value your concluding remarks, uh, the summary of the session. Yeah, I had a conversation with a medical legal expert and he said that as things stand now, we run the risk of being sued if we do not offer some form of thromboprophylaxis in our replacement cases. Not so, from, so much for the trauma cases, but definitely for THR and TKR. And that thromboprophylaxis can be as simple as a calf pump. But the more judicious way of going about it would be a calf pump, early mobilization, um, enoxaparin in the earlier phase, followed by apixaban or rivaroxaban uh, for the recommended duration. But the key thing is to admit and uh, acknowledge the fact that it's a real risk and something has to be done in the form of thromboprophylaxis. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. Dr. Ashok Sham, uh, if you are logged in, can I have your concluding remarks for the session? Yeah, I mean, again, we stratify the risk and choose a pro proper protocol. May it be a mechanical prophylaxis and then going on to pharmacological. But like uh, everybody agrees that we need some kind of prophylaxis for at least our arthroplasty cases. So depending on patient profile. Thank you. And as they say, save the best for the last. Dr. Bharat, I would like your concluding remarks uh, for today's session. Uh, thank you. So it's been an invigorating uh, revisitation of uh, this very important subject, and I thank my panelists for this energetic uh, you know, contribution. I don't think they have left any point uncovered for me to, as well, at the most, what I can say is that I endorse everything that Ronan and uh, Vidyanand has just uh, mentioned. And uh, all I would say is that I am personally certainly biased towards using NOACs now that the price points are very competitive. So I would not be able to fully understand my colleagues who would still stick to aspirin. Uh, if they if they say that, oh, but then that covers us medical legally, well, that's a very, uh, you know, facile way of approaching the matter. It's not just about medical legal coverage. It's about actual helping that patient without any, you know, causing any either financial overload or any uh, uh, medical harm in terms of any increased side effects. So yes, I am a firm believer of uh, using NOACs with all the advantages that they offer instead of just aspirin. Thank you so much. And I think with this, I would uh, conclude today's session. I would like to thank all my panelists who have allowed me to kindly moderate them. I think a wealth of experience has been shared. I would love to sign off and pass on the mic to Dr. Hasnat uh, Iqbal Khan to conclude the session further. Yeah, so uh, thank you everyone for this uh, great evening and such an interactive session. Just to conclude the session, what I have uh, what I have uh, grasped from the session is that uh, DVD is a concern in orthopedic study. Then thromboprophylaxis, uh, there are various uh, approaches right from your low molecular weight to your uh, newer anticoagulants, but Nox has an advantage over a low molecular weight heparin or your traditional uh, oral anticoagulants like uh, warfarin and over aspirin. Aspirin has a, what you say, a dilemma among the orthopedics, use and uh, not to use, but still Nox has a superior, uh, what you say, efficacy in terms of aspirin. Aspirin has its own benefits in terms of safety, but Nox has a superiority in terms of the, the efficacy. Just ending the part with the uh, Nox, uh, the uh, River of the versus Epixa case, which is the OD and the PID. So that's all from my side. I would just include uh, uh, Mr. Raghu from the marketing team to give a vote of thanks for the participants. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Asnath. Uh, once again, uh, good evening, doctors. 
on behalf of pulse pharma myself raghu subramanian heading the sales and marketing for the uh, maximus division of orthopedics and extend my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you for gracing us with your presence at this enlightening webinar on thromboprophylaxis in orthopedics and to fight against dvt first and foremost our sincere appreciation goes to all our distinguished panelists dr bharat modi sir dr parash sanjeevi sir dr raju ishran sir for moderating the entire session beautifully dr ranan roy sir giving their views dr raj vidyanand rao sir and dr ashok sham sir for helping us from the back end and coordinating with the speakers and doctors your expertise insights and dedication to advancing patient care in orthopedics have truly enriched this webinar providing us with a invaluable knowledge of innovative strategies in dvt prevention moreover i would like to express our gratitude to all the participants who actively engaged in the discussion shared with their perspective and contributed to making this webinar a collaborative and enriching experience last but not the least a special thank you to all the behind the scene individual who worked tirelessly to ensure the smooth organization of this and execution of this webinar so in conclusion your presence and participation has made this webinar a resounding success so once again we look forward for more such collaborative endeavors in future thank you once again for all the panelists for taking their own time and making this uh, webinar a grand success thank you and have a nice day Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. See you, sir. Thank you, yeah. sir. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Dr. Ronan. I'll meet up the next time that I'm there in Gupta. Thank you, yeah, sir. I look forward to that. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you, Dr. Raju. Great moderation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My pleasure. Rishi, you can stop the streaming and recording. Rishi, Rishi Rajan here from Pulse Pharma. Can you hear me?